Hello everyone, this is Mr. Schultz and this is the properties of water video for AP Biology. This video is video 1.1, so it's the first video of this unit. It covers the section uh, of Biology and Focus 2.5. So this video is going to cover the properties of water. Uh, we will have a lab on this in class. So, properties of water are all about hydrogen bonds. The water is held together by polar covalent bonds. So the actual water molecule, the two oxygen, or the one oxygen and two hydrogens, excuse me, um, are held together by what are called polar covalent bonds. So they share electrons, but they don't share them equally. So water is a polar molecule, which means that um, its charges are unevenly distributed, where the oxygen is partially negative and the hydrogen is partially positive. The reason for this is the oxygen is bigger and has more pull on the electrons than the hydrogens do. So the hydrogens are sharing their electrons, but the oxygen are kind of pulling it and taking it a little bit more. It's kind of like sharing something with an older sibling, where the older sibling tends to take the thing more often than the younger sibling. And there's no parent around to yell at you and make you give it up. So um, the other thing I want to point out real quick before we get too involved in this video is if you notice, um, vocab words that are highlighted in the textbook are oftentimes going to be highlighted in blue and bold in my PowerPoints. So if you're wondering what words are technically vocab words, these are some of them. Um, I usually don't miss them, so just keep that in mind. So, water molecules, they form hydrogen bonds between the oxygen of one water molecule with the hydrogen um, of another water molecule. So, if you look at the picture that I, I have on this slide, here's one water molecule and here's another one. So, what happens is here's the oxygen and here's the hydrogen from a different one. And because the hydrogen is just a little positive and the oxygen is just a little negative, they form these little hydrogen bonds. We always draw them as like three little dots showing that they're bonded, but it's not like stuck together bonded. Um, these hydrogen bonds are really strong in some scenarios and they can be really weak in others. So it's really interesting. Um, they are considered a weak bond because they're constantly for reforming and breaking though. So if you uh, keep this in mind, as water molecules as a liquid move around, they're constantly breaking in um, reattaching their hydrogen bonds between the same water molecules around them and the ones that are a little further away. Because water is a liquid, it's able to move past each other. Now, as water freezes, those hydrogen bonds stiffen and they cause the water to actually expand as ice freezes. That's why ice is less dense than water. Now, um, there are some really important vocab words that we need to know about properties of water. The first is called cohesion. And I like to think of it as cooperation between water molecules. It's when the hydrogen bonds hold a substance like water together. An example would be like water in the veins of plants. The water molecules are all held together by hydrogen bonds between other water molecules. So that allows water to stick together as it's being pulled up through the plant. Adhesion, uh, think of it like an adhesive sticking to something else. When hydrogen bonds allow one substance to cling to another. And a lot of times you're going to say water sticking to things, but keep in mind water isn't the only thing that can form hydrogen bonds. So this video is about properties of water, but some of these bonds can form between water and other things and other organisms as well, or molecules as well, organisms. Uh, yeah, sometimes I misspeak, sorry. All right, so um, an example of adhesion is when water clings to the cell walls of plants and against gravity. So um, you can see adhesion really well. If you take some water droplets and you put them on your hand and you lift your hand up, some of them will fall off because gravity is a cruel mistress. But um, some of them will actually stick to the top of your hand and that's adhesion. The water molecules are actually sticking to your hand. And we see this on blades of grass as well. Um, finally, there's surface tension. Surface tension is a measure of how difficult it is to stretch or break the surface of a liquid. Um, surface tension can be seen if you overfill a glass um, of water and you overfill it to the top and you notice there's like a bit of a bubble there. That's surface tension. Um, you also see surface tension um, in the penny lab. If you do a penny lab where you drop droplets on top of a penny and it kind of forms a nice bubble of water, that's surface tension. Surface tension can also be used by some organisms um, to surf across or skate across the top of water. So an example would be like um, water gliding insects use the surface tension to float around on top of the water, which is really cool. Uh, all right, so some other quick definitions before we get into some of the other properties of water. Kinetic energy is the energy of motion. So if you're on your bike and you're riding down the street, you have kinetic energy. 
And when you hit a car, a car pulls out in front of you and you hit them and you keep flying and your bike stops, your bike's kinetic energy is gone, but you still have it because you're still moving. So if you're moving, you have kinetic energy. Thermal energy is kinetic energy associated with the random movement of atoms or molecules. So if we think about like thermal energy or heat energy, um, we're talking about molecules moving around. The more, the higher the temperature, so the average kinetic energy of the molecules, regardless of volume, the higher the temperature, the more movement there is. The uh, molecules are moving faster and they have more kinetic energy. Heat is thermal energy that is transferred from one body of matter to another. Now that could be like if you're holding hands with somebody and you have hot, warm hands and they have cold hands, eventually your hands will even out a little bit because you'll be, your heat will transfer to them. Um, same thing with if you grab a hot pan off of the oven or off, out of this oven or off the stove and you don't have an oven mitt on, that heat will transfer from the metal of the, the pan into your hand. I don't recommend it. I've done it a couple of times, it's never fun. But understand that heat is thermal energy that is passed from one thing to another. Um, thermal energy is the energy associated with the mo movement of molecules. So, the reason we needed to talk about that is because it deals with water has a high specific heat. Specific heat is the amount of heat that must be absorbed or lost for one gram of that substance to change its temp by one degree centigrade. It takes more energy to change the temperature of water compared to the other substances around it, so water changes temps less than other liquids. So if you put heat in a liquid, say just water, it takes a lot more heat energy to heat up, uh, to change the temperature of that water, as opposed to if you have a, uh, a beaker of, let's say, just ethanol, which is a liquid at room temperature, and you add heat to it, it evaporates much, much quicker. It has a much lower specific heat. This is due to the hydrogen bonds. They hold water together better, which helps it resist change due to temperature. Um, and why is this important for biology? Because it's like, yeah, big deal. So water takes forever to change temperature. Well, large bodies of water, they don't have major swings in temperature. If you live near a major body of water, like a lake, um, like a big lake, like Lake Michigan or Lake Superior, or if you live by the ocean, your temperatures tend to stay a little more stable. Now, there's some caveats to this. If you go to Florida, it gets really hot no matter what. And that's because it's closer to the equator and they get more direct sunlight. But um, what's interesting is like places like San Diego, if you go down by the beach, it's 72 because the high specific heat of water keeps that temperature of the air much cooler. Um, and the ocean temps, they tend to be more stable. Um, with a few exceptions, like the Gulf uh, of Mexico tends to get pretty warm as the summer goes on, which is what leads to stronger hurricanes too, by the way. Um, but if you look at the temperatures, if you if you go along the coast of um, along California, like Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, and San Diego, they're, they can be in the 70s, or it could be upwards in the 90s, just a few miles to the west, because the water absorbs a lot of that heat, and it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature. So the water temperature stays cool, the air around it stays cool, and then as you move further inland, uh, rocks and ground, they tend to get hot pretty fast. So, another important part of, pro another property of water that's really important is what's called evaporative cooling. The heat of vaporization is the amount of heat needed to evaporate one gram of a substance. It requires a lot of energy to break these hydrogen bonds. Yeah, they're not very strong between the water molecules, but yet they're incredibly strong for holding them together in terms of like adding and removing heat. And why is this important? Well, it helps moderate the, uh, the, the planet's climate um, because it takes a lot of energy to evaporate water. Um, water is not is less likely to be turned into a gas and then pulled into the atmosphere, which would create all sorts of havoc. Because if all the water was in the atmosphere, there'd be none on the ground and we'd have all sorts of issues. Um, and this actually causes steam burns to be much more severe. There's a really a ton of energy in water molecules when they turn into steam. Um, steam is simply just gaseous water molecules, so they have a lot of energy and they're high in heat. And so steam burns tend to be really bad because there's a lot of energy transferred into your hand or your arm when you get a steam burn. Um, also, why you should wear oven mitts when you're grabbing something hot out of the oven or the microwave, and then pour it away from you so you don't end up with that steam in your face. Um, steam burns are no fun. Evaporative cooling is where the hottest molecules are more likely to evaporate, reducing the temperature of the molecules left behind. When a hot molecule leaves, it tends to pull some energy with it, which cools the molecules around it. 
Um, and this is what helps stabilize lake and pond temperatures. So as it gets hot outside, um, the water in a lake or a pond might be getting evaporated on the surface, which causes the water to go down, but it also cools off the water near it. And so what happens is it helps stabilize temperatures in lakes and ponds, which is really important if you're a fish, because if the temperature is too hot, you could die because fish, um, their temperatures are regulated by this, the te their internal temps are regulated by their the external temperature around them. And so they generally have a very specific range of temperatures they like to live in. And some fish like warm, some fish like cold, some fish don't care. And so if you change the temperature suddenly, that can cause fish to die. Um, it's also used to cool down terrestrial organisms. So, you know, I got the, the silly meme here, uh, but sweat is uh, an example of evaporative cooling. When you're outside and it's really hot, your body sweats so that it, as the sweat evaporates, it pulls heat with it, and it reduces the temperature of the molecules around it. Not all organisms sweat. If you think about dogs pant, okay? So dogs are panting to help evaporate and cool off their body. So this is an example of evaporative cooling. It's incredibly important, especially for terrestrial organisms, because overheating can be a huge issue. So um, another property of water that's really important is that ice floats. Um, Water is less dense when it is a solid than when it is a liquid. All those hydrogen bonds, they kind of crystallize and they cause the water molecules to spread out more. And as they do that, the density of the water molecules um, spreads out. And it's important for a number of reasons. Number one, if ice sank instead of floating, all the bodies of water would freeze solid as it gets cold because the ice would, get to the, would fall to the bottom and slowly but surely the whole thing would just freeze solid. Um, and this would be a major problem if you're an ocean organism or a lake organism because you can't live frozen solid generally, unless you're like bacteria and a few other things that are, can handle extremes. Um, it also creates an insulation with the water. So if you've ever gone ice fishing, what you'll notice is that the temperature above the ice could be like negative 20. It could be a really cold, windy, nasty winter day. The ice is frozen. It's probably right around that temperature as well. But as you dig into the ice and you get into the water, the water will be warmer. It'll still be at or a, a little above freezing generally. And the reason for this is the ice creates an insulator from the cold temperatures. And so that way, when ice freezes over, um, the organisms can live underneath and still survive. And this is really important for life. At one point, we believe the earth was completely covered in ice. But because ice floated, the organisms that were alive underneath were probably able to still survive near volcanic vents and other areas because the insulation prevented the full ice um, to freeze over and completely freeze solid. So that's really important. Ice floating is an important property of life and water in general. So some other quick definitions. A solution is a liquid that is a completely homogeneous mixture, that means you can't see the parts, of two or more substances. A solvent is the dissolved agent of a solution. A solute is the substance that is dissolved, is what you put into the liquid. And an aqueous solution is when water is the solvent. So an example would be, I have my little pitcher of crystal light. The solution is a crystal light. You can't see the separate parts of it. It just looks like basically pink water, okay? The solvent is the dissolving agent. In this case, I use tap water. Um, and the solute is the crystal light um, packet, so all the little particles of crystal light. It is technically an aqueous solution because it's in water. Now, if I had mixed it to something else, say ethanol, which I wouldn't recommend, okay, gross, um, it would not be an aqueous solution anymore. It would be some other solution, if it even formed one. Um, water is a universal solvent. It's really cool. Because of water's polar nature, um, it's really versatile for breaking things apart. So what happens is water will form what are called hydration shells, and they're spheres of water that surround dissolved ions. So when you drop salt in water, the water molecules aren't just breaking the salt down, they're actually surrounding the actual elements themselves. And then the rest of the water that doesn't do this is just floating around as the liquid part. Water can also dissolve non-ionic polar uh, molecules. So ions would be, ionic bonds would be like salts and things like that. But other things um, that are polar can also be dissolved in water. Sugars are technically polar. So when you pour sugar in water, 
the water will break the sugar pieces down into smaller molecules of sugar. Same molecule. It doesn't break them apart. It just separates them and surrounds them. Um, and that's where you can get like sugar water, which is why like Crystal Light and Kool-Aid work the way they do. Uh, also be aware of these two words, hydrophilic and hydrophobic molecules. Hydro means water. Philic means love. So hydrophilic molecules love water. What this means is that they, um, it doesn't have to dissolve, um, but it, it likes water. So water moves around it really easily. And so water can pass through it and carry it as well. Now, just because you're hydrophilic doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to dissolve completely. So an example of this is cotton. Cotton is actually um, hydrophobic, but the cellulose doesn't dissolve. Um, and actually, I think I made a mistake here. I think uh, cotton is actually hydrophilic. It likes water. It attaches to water, but it doesn't break down in water. It just kind of attaches to it and forms a lot of hydrogen bonds between it. Hydrophobic is any substance that hates water. It doesn't like being around water. A classic experiment of this is like when you're a kid and you add water and cooking oil and they separate into two layers. That's because they're hydro the oil is hydrophobic. It doesn't like being around water. And so what happens is it tends to clump together. So hydrophobic is any substance that is nonpolar and non-ionic and it repels water. Oils are generally hydrophobic. There's a few exceptions, and what we find out in biology is that there's a lot of sometimes just little exceptions to some of these things. Our cell membranes use similar molecules to oils to help keep them together. And if you look down here, I have what's called a um, phospholipid shell, and this is kind of how our cell membranes work. Um, our cell membranes are made up of what are called phospholipids, and we'll talk about these a little bit more later um, in another video. But phospholipids are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. They have different parts of their molecule that are um, have different properties. And so the hydrophobic tails, they hate water. So what they'll do is they'll form a, um, a layer, a double layer, where all the tails are together because they don't like water. And the heads, they love water. So they're on the outside. They're happy. The tails are happy because there's no water in between. And they form a shell naturally. So if you were to actually take a whole bunch of phospholipids and pour them into pure water, you would get these little bubble shells of phospholipid bilayers. Uh, this concludes the video on properties of water. Again, as any time, if you have any questions relating to these properties or if you want more information, please feel free to ask me. Otherwise, you can also find a number of videos on the properties of water and some really cool demonstrations as well. So if you, um, this is the conclusion of this video. The next video will probably start on the biomolecules.